Well, good morning and welcome. Delighted to have you at the 16th annual Richard B. Gaffin Jr. Lecture on Theology, Mission, and Culture. We will be introduced more fully to our guest lecturer this morning, Dr. Phil Riken. Our president will introduce him more later. But I want to have a few, uh, take a few moments here to welcome some other special guests that are here in our midst. First, students, you're always welcome. Glad, glad that you are here. Alumni, we welcome you back to Westminster and are delighted that you've taken this day to be back on campus with us again. Pastors and friends who are gathered with us either on uh, in this live stream or here in this room this morning, we also welcome you. It is a pleasure then personally to welcome our most honored guest, the Dr. Richard B. Gaffin, Jr. Dr. Gaffin, where are you? I know you're in here somewhere. Would you stand, please, so everyone can recognize you? <laughs> With Dr. Gaffin are his two sons and their wives. First, I want to introduce Richard B. Gaffin III and his wife, Yvonne. So if the two of you would stand as well. I don't know why you're not sitting together, but I won't pursue, pursue that. Um, I also want to welcome uh, Dr. Gaffin's other son, Steve, and his wife, Linda. If you two would please stand as well. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Lilbach will we'll, we'll welcome our honored speaker this morning, Dr. Riken, in just a, a few minutes. Just want to remind you a bit about the schedule for the day. Of course, we have this, uh, this lecture this morning here in Rust at 11 with, uh, with Dr. Riken, of course. But then this afternoon, we have actually six different lectures. They're shorter lectures, 30 minutes each, starting at 2.15, right back here in Rust Auditorium. And I would actually like to just have all of those speakers rise where you are, and I'll just one by one name you. Those who are speaking this afternoon, would you, would you please rise? First, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Guy Waters. Guy, where are you? There you are, down here in the front. Dr. Marcus Menninger. We have Dr. Bob Kara. There you are, okay. And of course, our very own Dr. Vern Poitras in the back here. I will be speaking as well. And then Dr. Eric Watkins, who is down here in the front. Fuller introductions to come this afternoon. There will be, just by, um, by way of further details, announcements at the end of this service today. And so now I would like to invite you to open your hymnals to hymn number 660, and we will stand together to sing, O oh God, Beyond All Praising.
us now come before our God in prayer. Lord God, we come before you now acknowledging that you are a great God and greatly to be praised. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There is nothing that has been made that did not proceed from your powerful hand, and we know that all we have and all we are is due to your sovereign working in our lives. We thank you for your many good gifts. We thank you as you are our creator, you are also our redeemer. We thank you for the atoning death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who as our prophet, priest, and king intercedes for us at your right hand and thereby reconciles us to you and makes it possible for us to come before you as children to a father. Lord, may the name of Jesus Christ be lifted up. We long for, that, for the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, we thank you for your church, that you have called a people to yourself and have blessed them. We are grateful that you have not left us in darkness, but have called us into your marvelous light, giving to the church your word and your Holy Spirit to guide us. We ask that you would strengthen your church, that its witness would be faithful, and that the schemes of the devil would not prevail against it. We pray particularly for the ministers of your word and that they would be faithful in gospel proclamation, diligent in shepherding and counseling, and courageous in leadership. Above all, may all they do show forth the love of Christ. As we thank you for the ministers of the word, we thank you also for the many years that you have used this institution to equip and prepare men for ministry. Lord, please continue to keep your hand of blessing on Westminster so that it remains faithful in proclaiming the whole counsel of God and grant to it all it needs to continue in the important work of raising up future leaders for the good of your church and the glory of your name. We pray this likewise for other seminaries that, like Westminster, are committed to the advancement of the Reformed faith. Lord, we ask now for your blessings on this gathering. We thank you for our brother, Dr. Riken, and the many ways you have used him to the good of your people. We ask that you would bless him now as he speaks to us. We ask, too, that you would bless him in all the ways that you have called him. Lord, may he be encouraged in your service. We think, too, of this afternoon. We thank you for all of those who have been involved uh, in preparing those sessions. We pray that you would bless that time together. We ask that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing to you. We pray now in confidence knowing that we pray to the one who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, and because we pray in the name above all names, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's my privilege to do some introductions. Dr. Richard B. Gaffin, Jr. is here with us, and we all know who he is, but we should remember that this is one of the foundational professors of Westminster Seminary in our legacy. He's taught for us some 50 years. Some 3,000 students have been under his tutelage, and his foundational and epic-making works are on display out in the uh, narthex for you to look at and remind yourselves of maybe when you read that book and how it changed your thinking from that point on. I think of him as the man who's reintroduced Pentecost to the Presbyterian world. <laughs> Somehow we're so afraid of Pentecostalism we almost forgot Pentecost is the change of history for the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And Dr. Gaffin changed that for us, and we thank him for that, by being a diligent student of the work of the Holy Spirit, the resurrected Christ, and his power and ministry in the church today. It's a great honor to continue on in the 16th of the Gaffin Lecture Series. Uh, we are grateful that Dr. Garner, who has uh, uh, introduced us today, is carrying on the legacy of the Charles Crahey Chair that Dr. Gaffin filled. We'll be having the joy in the coming months to inaugurate uh, Dr. Garner into that position. Dr. Gaffin has been the Emeritus Professor of Westminster since 2008, and even though he says he's fully retired, we're still calling him our professor. So thank you, sir. Really, let's give him another round of applause. Now, he, he's always very embarrassed that we honor him this way, but I wanted to remind him as a church historian, the scriptures 
which, by the way, that verse gives me job description. It says in Hebrews 13, remember those who taught you the word of God. So someone's got to remind you about it, so we need church historians. And then on top of that, it says, consider the outcome of their life, and then imitate their faith. And that's one of the reasons why Reformed people can do conferences like this, because it's biblical to do so. It's not that we're going to try to imitate Dr. Gaffin. He, nobody can imitate him. He's one of a kind. But we do want to imitate his faithfulness and faith in the scriptures. And so we praise God for that. And, of course, that verse in Hebrews 13 is followed with, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he who is the heart of all the scriptures is why we're here together. It's also my joy, then, to introduce our special uh, speaker, preacher for this uh, conference beginning. Dr. Phil Riken will be speaking about the threefold office of the risen Christ and its implications for the ministry of the gospel. And again, Dr. Riken probably doesn't need any introduction, but we should honor him with one anyway. And so we want to remind you that he is the eighth and current president of Wheaton College. Uh, he is a Westminster graduate. He did his doctorate in church history on Thomas Boston at Oxford University. He served as a pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church as a colleague and then successor of uh, James Montgomery Boyce. He is a prolific author and a very accomplished preacher. He did his internship in ministry with uh, George Cotton, that's going to become Dr. George Cotton at this commencement meeting. And uh, he served uh, many years as our uh, secretary on our board. So, Dr. Cotton, in the making, you've had an impact on our speaker today, and we thank you for that. But as we uh, come to this point, we want to remember that the ministry in the Word of God that Phil Riken is committed to now extends to some 50 different volumes that he has written or edited. In fact, Phil, I looked at uh, your Wikipedia page, and it only says 30. Ours says 50. You've got to update that page. The only problem is if you update it, they're going to have to change the number next week because he's so prolific, more will be coming. Well, it's our great honor to welcome Dr. Phil Riken back to Westminster, a former board member, but always a friend and a graduate of Westminster. Let's give him a round of applause. We're going to have the reading of the scriptures, and before we do that, we'd like to ask Dr. Riken's wife, Lisa, to stand up, and let's welcome her as well. She's here. Please rise. Thank you so much. I'm going to be reading from Acts 13, 13 to 39. <clears throat> now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them the land as their inheritance. All this took place about four, all this took about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, 
What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, no. But behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utter utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemn fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tube. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring to you good news, that what God promised to the fathers, this he, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as, as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more return to corruption he has spoken in this way. No more to turn, no more to turn, no more to return to corruption he has spoken this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and in him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Thank you, Dr. Lilbeck, for that generous introduction. Uh, don't believe everything you read on Wikipedia. That same article says that I am known to enjoy water skiing for reasons that are not entirely clear to me. It's sort of true, but not, not true in any important way. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here to honor uh, Dr. Gaffin and to uh, benefit, we hope, from these uh, lectures today. I want to say because of my very high regard for Professor Richard Birch Gaffin, Jr. as a scholar, as a mentor, as a Christian gentleman, I consider it to be a very great honor to participate in these lectures and to speak with you on theology, culture, and mission. Westminster students of my era revered Dr. Gaffin for his charity, his piety, his profound understanding of Christian theology. To sit in his classroom furiously taking notes on his exquisitely worded lectures on Acts and Paul, for example, was itself, and I say this in all seriousness, an eschatological experience. Part of our ministerial inauguration into the glories of a coming kingdom to put it another way, <laughs> preferably with an informal verbal aside, we were gaffinized. As a library employee, I had the further privilege one year of playing with Dr. Gaffin, not against him, when he took the mound for our annual faculty student softball game. The goose, as some of us called him for his exploits on the ball field. Uh, my wife, Lisa, and I were also part of a regular book discussion group with uh, Dr. Gaffin and also with his wife, Jean. So we had the amazing privilege of knowing Jean Young Gaffin and also Liesl Margaret Gaffin, two extraordinary women that we will see again in the splendor of our once and future king. These are sacred memories for us. And so it's a joyful privilege to be back at Westminster Seminary today and to speak with you on the threefold office of the risen Christ and its implications for the ministry of the gospel, a lecture I will give in seven parts. Part one, a brief history of the Munis triplex, a brief history of the Munis triplex. The threefold office 
of Christ as prophet, priest, and king is pervasive in the Old and New Testaments, providing a framework for the Christ-centered exposition and application of Holy Scripture. The first known recognition of our Savior's munis triplex appears in the opening pages of Eusebius of Caesarea's famous ecclesiastical history, where the venerable theologian notes three Old Testament callings that came through anointing with oil and then connects those callings with the work of Jesus the Christ, who is, he says, the sole high priest of the universe, the sole king of all creation, and of the prophets, the sole archprophet of the Father. Eusebius proceeds to make explicit the source of the one true Christ's anointing, not, he says, with oil prepared from material substances, but with the divine spirit himself by participation in the deity of the Father. And so at the dawn of this doctrine in church history, theologians were clear that the threefold office of Christ is a ministry of God the Holy Spirit. And so were the reformers. When they reclaimed this threefold office for the people of God. Just as they used to anoint kings, priests, and prophets, writes Martin Bootser, so now Christ is king of kings, rex regum, highest priest, sumus sacerdos, and chief of the prophets, prophetarum caput. Many of us learned well from Dr. Gaffin that, and I quote, the baptism of Jesus is his investiture with his messianic task, his official installation as Messiah at the Jordan. Gaffin writes, the Spirit descends on the baptized Jesus as anointing, as gifting, requisite and essential for carrying out his impending messianic mission. And what I wish to make explicit in this lecture, as it were in dialogue with Dr. Gaffin, is that this baptismal investiture empowers Christ in his threefold office. John Owen, the Puritan theologian, thus distinguishes between, quote, Christ's real unction by the Holy Ghost with all fullness of gifts and graces at his incarnation and his declarative unction at his baptism when the Holy Spirit filled him with power for the exercise of all gifts and graces for the discharge of his whole office, end quote. And because of this spirit baptism, which is an office anointing, the munis triplex deserves our attention not only as a crux in our Christology, but also as a locus in our pneumatology. This doctrine has a beautiful history in Christian thought, which I, and I wish we had more time to explore that history. For our present, and I've written about it elsewhere, but for our present purposes, it may be sufficient to say that this threefold office of Christ runs through medieval, reformation, evangelical theology right up to the present day in one form or another taught by Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Wesley, Turretin, Newman as an Anglican, and many others. We owe Luther a special debt of gratitude for his recognition that we are all spirit-anointed for sacerdotal ministry, the priesthood of all believers. And we owe Calvin a similar debt for his clarity about the prophetic office of Jesus Christ. After 1,500 years, when believers effectively had been defrocked, Luther and Calvin restored the people of God to their proper office. And as some of you will know, in recent years, there's been a, something of a resurgence of biblical and theological interest in the munis triplex as a paradigm for practical theology that gives us a tri-perspectival reference point for gospel ministry and spiritual leadership. And this was emphasized for me virtually in my first hour of class at Westminster Seminary when Tim Keller was speaking with us about the threefold office of Christ. 
And I think this resurgence is unsurprising because the threefold office enlivens our faith in the beautiful person and redeeming work of Jesus Christ. It unifies our interpretation of Scripture and also our proclamation of Scripture. It empowers us to preach the gospel literally from every page in the Bible. And it also helps us understand our calling in the world. Whether we are at home or at work, at school, in church, in the community, we too are in the lowercase, prophets, priests, and kings, in our missionary proclamation of the gospel, in our merciful intercession for this fallen world, in our ministry leadership for the kingdom. We all have these doctoral, sacerdotal, regnal responsibilities. And we too are baptized by the Holy Spirit who equips every believer to be a prophet who brings the truth, a priest who sympathetically serves, a king who calls others into accountable love. These are phrases from Dr. Keller. Our threefold ministry carries Christ's anointed offices into the world. Part two, the cross in three dimensions. The cross in three dimensions. My life in ministry has been enriched immeasurably by reflecting on the threefold office of my Savior, and maybe specifically so, most specifically so, in connection with his crucifixion. When we consider Christ's saving work on the cross in these three dimensions, we might think first of his priestly oblation. But the munistriplex helps us see the cross of Christ in three dimensions because in his crucifixion, our Savior carried out all three of his offices. He carried out priestly ministry by making an atoning blood sacrifice and in the prayer that he offered for his enemies. In his dying hours, Jesus exercised prophetic office by teaching the Word of God. In effect, he was using the cross as a pulpit, speaking seven last words to remind us of the promises of God. Calvin focused on our Savior's third office by defining the crucifixion as a royal act in which the king is lifted up to unexpected triumph. To quote from Calvin in his commentary, on Philippians, there is no tribunal so magnificent, no throne so stately, no show of triumph so distinguished, no chariot so elevated as is the gibbet on which Christ has subdued death and the devil. More recently, taking his cue from Calvin, Jeremy Treat says that on the cross, as a prophetic priestly king, Christ is exalted in his humiliation. Now take a closer look and see an even more profound ministry, Christ humiliated in each office. Before handing Jesus over to the Romans, his Jewish tormentors spat in his face, slapped him and said, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? For their part, Roman soldiers scoffed at his kingship with scarlet robe, crown of thorns, scepter of straw. Kneeling in mock homage, they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And later, while he was offering himself up for our sins, people scorned the efficacy of his priestly sacrifice. He saved others, they mocked. Let him save himself if he is the Christ. And yet at that very moment, our great high priest was offering his body and blood as a sacrifice for their sins, for our sins. In short, on the cross, people, people bullied Jesus for being who he was. And so he suffered as prophet, as priest, as king. Klaus Skilder expresses this beautifully. for He says, for it is as the absolute and only true bearer of that triple office that Jesus passed through the whole course of his suffering as one always discharging that threefold responsibility. And so far from functioning as some sort of theological abstraction, the threefold office of Christ draws us closer to our Savior. It, it gives us a deeper understanding of his gospel. It prepares us to endure our own suffering ministry to the world. Part three, the resurrection in three dimensions. 
the resurrection in three dimensions. Now, if it is true that the crucifixion is three-dimensional, then what about the resurrection? Now I come more, pri- more precisely to my purpose. If our Savior's offices conferred, converge at the cross, do they also come out with him from the empty tomb? What do we learn about the munis triplex when we shift our focus from the suffering, dying Christ to the risen, ascended Christ? And how do we experience our Savior's threefold ministry in his exaltation as well as his humiliation? through the power of his resurrection, as well as in the fellowship of his sufferings. Here is my thesis, and it's, it's a bit complicated, but I'll repeat it at the end. The prophetic, priestly, and kingly offices prophesied in the Old Testament, inaugurated with the Incarnation, publicly proclaimed at our Lord's baptism, and then exercised in his earthly ministry, those those offices did not cease with the climactic events of Calvary, but rather when the loving Father summoned the redeeming Son from the grave by his life-giving Spirit, our prophet, priest, king rose again and then ascended to heaven with the full powers of his offices. To put this another way, the risen Lord Jesus Christ is eternal prophet, eternal priest, eternal king. Now, to prove this point, my my first thought was to take a wide-angle vision, everything from Acts to Revelation, but it, it took me only about 30 minutes to realize that was way too much for one lecture. And so I am narrowing my aperture all the way down to the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension. This brief epoch which Dr. Gaffin has described as a kind of hiatus, a brief pause in which redemptive history is, so to speak, put on hold. Or is it? Certainly there is something anomalous about our Savior's 40-day transition from empty tomb to eternal throne. These days when, as Dr. Gaffin also says, he had entered his state of exaltation, but yet not yet gone to his place of exaltation. And yet in these final days of earthly ministry, I believe we see the risen Christ begin to exercise his threefold office, setting a trajectory for his priestly, kingly, and yes, prophetic ministry to and through the apostolic church. During this pivotal time, this this small window, the not yet ascended Christ also set the trajectory for the apostles in their threefold ministry to the world and, by extension, set the trajectory for our own ministry as prophets, priests, and kings. For in the last days of his earthly ministry, our Lord and Savior promised to send us his empowering spirit. So I want to take this narrower focus, 40 days following Easter Sunday, as a way of helping us understand Christ's threefold office more clearly, I hope, and more comprehensively. As we scan the conclusion of the Gospels and the introduction of Acts, what signs do we see that the resurrection is the apotheosis of the munis triplex, inaugurating a new era of threefold ministry, both for Christ and for us, his Christians? Part four, resurrection and proclamation. Resurrection and proclamation. In the days and weeks that followed his resurrection, Jesus carried forward his prophetic ministry. Nearly from the moment that living breath refilled his lungs, the risen Christ had more kingdom truth to proclaim. He proclaimed it on the road to Emmaus when, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, Luke 24, 27. This hermeneutical tour de force was prophetical in its exposition of the gospel. And hanging on every word, his disciples walking with Jesus said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he opened to us the scriptures? In the days 
before his crucifixion, these disciples had known Jesus primarily, these are their words, as a prophet mighty in word and deed. And this had not changed. The risen Christ, too, was mighty prophet of the word of God. What turned into a sort of 40-day symposium in biblical theology continued in Jerusalem. And there we know this from the end of Luke 24, Jesus presented his glorified wounds as visible apologetic for his bodily resurrection. And then he proceeded to explicate the implications of the empty tomb. He opened his disciples' minds to understand the scriptures, those scriptures which testified that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Now, some recent discussions of the, of the Munis triplex have tended to downgrade Christ's enduring prophetic office. But I believe we do well to maintain the threefold anointed office that Eusebius found in the Old Testament scriptures and that Calvin and others recovered for the Reformation church. Jesus set this trajectory in his post-resurrection appearances when his prophetic ministry was as prominent as his priestly and kingly ministry, if not more so. Dr. Gaffin describes this period as largely a time of instruction in which the resurrected Christ, having succeeded in his kingdom task and triumphed in his messianic suffering, explained its significance and the consequent glory, end quote. And in this way, Jesus became the first prophet of the newly inaugurated kingdom of God. Nor did our Lord's prophetic witness pertain only to the past, to Old Testament interpretation. In the weeks that followed, Jesus gave his disciples prophetic words for the future, words pertaining to Peter's God-glorifying death, for example, or the witness-bearing work that the apostles would have to the ends of the earth. It's a prophetic interpretation of the Old Testament, but it is also a prophetic anticipation of the work of the church. And our Lord's 40-day proclamation of the kingdom. And in those days, prophecies for the future church, those things were only the beginning, according to Luke, as you know well from the opening verse of Acts. This is part of what Jesus began to do and began to teach in his earthly ministry. In effect, the good doctor is telling his readers, you ain't seen nothing yet. As once and future prophet, Jesus has more to say and more to do. And it is clear from his greatest commission that Jesus intends to carry out this prophetical ministry through the preaching of the apostles. You will be my witnesses, he says, speaking most directly to the twelve in their witness bearing for the crucified and risen Christ, as we saw in Acts chapter 13, the apostles would exercise a prophetic office. And for this, of course, they would need to be anointed. If you're going to be a prophet, you must be anointed. That's the sacred act that serves as the sine qua non for any office. And as it was for their Savior, the effective agent of this apostolic anointing is God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit Jesus previously had promised to send. And Jesus repeatedly, even in the brief words we have during this brief period, Jesus repeatedly connects witness bearing to spirit consecration. The inauguration of their threefold office will flow from a triune dispensation, the the sending of the spirit by the Father and the Son. This power will come upon them from on high, which presupposes the ascension Another way of saying this is that the munis triplex, the threefold office, is on a trajectory that can only be empowered by a Savior who presented himself alive to his disciples after his suffering by many proofs. It requires a risen Savior who shortly will return to his heavenly Father, the risen and ascended prophet. In addition to serving as an external manifestation of his royal enthronement, and I'll come back to that. I am saying that the spirit gifts of the risen, ascended Christ now also perpetuate his prophetic office. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says on the eve of his ascension, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit 
Not many days from now you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. You see, primary among the purposes and effects of their spirit baptism is the prophetic ministry that they will exercise on behalf of their Lord Jesus Christ. There is a trajectory set here in the post-resurrection appearances of Christ that sets us on a course of prophetic ministry for the world. And throughout the last 40 days of his first earthly ministry, we see Jesus of Nazareth bring the prophetic office into new focus. And we also see that office promised in its widest scope because the witness bearing of the apostles will be for the whole world, for all nations. This is the witness that they will bear. Praise God, that worldwide witness now continues through the prophetic office of the church. Christ's commands and commissions were given in the first instance to the apostles, but the coming of the Spirit is for the proclamation of the gospel to the end of the age. We too have been given a teaching anointing. And while, of course, wishing to preserve the unique prerogatives of the apostles, Dr. Gaffin also concedes what is true for the apostles, I'm quoting now, is the foundation of the church is also true for the church as it subsequently builds on the apostles in non-foundational ways. So we can say that the spirit come at Pentecost is the power for the ongoing activity of worldwide witness given to the church as a whole. In short, it's ongoing prophetic ministry, which Christ now chiefly exercises through the global proclamation of of his gospel, what we might call the prophethood of all believers. This fundamentally was Calvin's understanding of the gospel ministry. There's an ongoing connection between what Jesus received from the Father and what he poured out on the church, between the Spirit anointing him and the Spirit anointing us, especially those ordained to preach the gospel. Calvin put it like this, when someone goes up into the pulpit, it is so that God should speak to us by the mouth of man. And in this way, the power of the Spirit is present in the continuing preaching of the gospel, end quote. This is one of the diverse ways, the Westminster Larger Catechism styles it, through which Christ executes the office of a prophet. Part five, resurrection and intercession. Resurrection and intercession. Jesus exercised his priestly ministry preeminently through his atoning death. Jesus did more at Calvary than bring a sacrifice as priests had done since the days of Aaron. He became the sacrifice. And yet his, his priesthood persists. Indeed, it is endless. We know this, for example, from Hebrews, which regards believers in Christ as having present continuous access to the sympathetic priesthood of the Son of God who is a priest, high priest forever and always lives to make intercession on our behalf. This perpetual priesthood, like prophethood, came into sharper focus after Jesus rose from the dead. A new epoch of divine access had been symbolized dramatically at the time of the crucifixion by the rending of the temple veil. Through the death of Jesus, this was the point, we are brought nearer to God. But how much closer we come through the life of Jesus. First, resurrection and now also ascension secure the ongoing office of his priesthood. Only an endless heavenly life, writes Gavin Ortland, achieved by resurrection and exaltation can result in perpetual priestly ministry and thus eternal salvation. Perhaps the most obvious post-resurrection indication of this ministration was simply the living presence of the Lord Jesus coming alongside his people in loving care. For the first disciples, the great joy of Easter Sunday was being again with Jesus in the garden, on the road, in a private room, on the shores of the sea. In each place, Jesus consoling and encouraging them in priestly fashion, not just teaching them, but also caring for them. And this ministry of presence was far from temporary. The Gospel of Matthew closes with this thrilling promise, I am with you always to the end of the age. The ascended priest could only make good on these promises by sending his indwelling spirit again with the Holy Spirit. 
Pentecost, as Dr. Gaffin never ceases to remind us, marks a turning point in the history of redemption. It is also an epical event for the Munis triplex. That is getting close to the heart of my thesis. The priestly presence the disciples experienced after Jesus rose from the dead, so alive, so animating, continued for them and now for us through the sending of God's Spirit. And so the result with respect to the priestly office is the ongoing ministry of Christ's presence. With his presence comes also forgiveness. Before the apostles could preach the forgiveness of sins, they needed to experience it for themselves, this priestly ministration of pardon. And so during this 40-day window that we're opening on Christ's threefold office, we glimpse our Savior's forgiveness For example, in his conversation with Simon Peter, you remember Jesus inquiring after Peter's religious affections. Do you love me, he asked, not once, but thrice, a threefold repetition that called to mind tenderly, surely painfully, Peter's previous betrayal. But it was also accompanied with a threefold charge that that served as the assurance of Peter's pardon, feed my lambs. The disciples' call to be a a spiritual shepherd confirmed that his sin was definitely known and also completely forgiven. And this empowered Peter to fulfill his calling and preach the forgiveness of sins to all nations, which he began to do at Pentecost. So priestly ministry of presence, of forgiveness, also of prayer. Peter's restoration itself was an answer to prayer, another primary aspect of priestly office. You'll remember that before Peter's threefold betrayal, Jesus had prayed specifically that his disciples' faith would not fail. Jesus prayed again for Peter and the other disciples on the eve of his crucifixion, that high priestly prayer in John 17. Jesus did not stop praying for his disciples after he rose from the dead. We overhear one of his prayers in Emmaus, where he blessed the breaking of the bread where the Father answered that prayer by opening the eyes of his disciples to recognize the risen Christ. This intercession is one of the resulting benefits of the resurrection and, for us, ascension. The Apostle Paul made this connection clear in Romans 8. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. John Owen, who I cited earlier, articulated the connection between Christ's resurrection ascension and his priesthood intercession. With these words, although he ascended not into heaven to be made a priest, but as a priest, yet his ascension, exaltation, and glorious immortality, the power of his indestructible life, were antecedently necessary to the actual discharge of some duties belonging unto that office. In other words, it was necessary for Jesus to be exalted in this way with his immortal resurrection body so that he could fulfill his priestly duties. Specifically, Owen goes on to say, his intercession and the application of his oblation. Another closely related ministration that comes into clearer focus with the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ is benediction, the priestly bestowal of blessing. This sacred tradition that went all the way back to Aaron, to Numbers chapter 6. So too Jesus led his disciples out as far as Bethany. This is the end of Luke 24. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. This was the final act of his first earthly ministry, his resurrection priest, the risen Christ, blessing his disciples, imparting to them the benefits of of the empty tomb. I think we can say he not only pronounced the benediction, he was the benediction. In John's gospel, you get an equally potent benediction, the the breathing out of the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And in that context, Jesus pronouncing not once but twice upon his disciples, peace, a clear echo of the ironic original, the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you, give you peace. With this Spirit-filled benediction, Jesus calls, commissions, I think we can say, anoints his disciples into their own 
priestly ministry. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit, so also the disciples must be anointed with the Spirit for their priestly mission to the world. John baptized with water, you will be baptized, Jesus said, with the Holy Spirit. This is a moment of Pentecostal empowerment for royal priesthood. And the apostles confirmed their commitment to Christ's forever priesthood in their preaching, starting the very day that they received the Holy Spirit. Peter was proclaiming the gospel to the nations in Jerusalem, and he focuses on the risen and exalted Christ. His thoughts turn to Psalm 110, the song of the royal priest, in his mind, because it had been so much on Jesus' mind in his last days of earthly ministry, that psalm that celebrates Christ's regal and also sacerdotal offices as Melchizedek's endless heir. As the disciples begin to preach, they are thinking in terms of priestly and kingly ministry. And the present priesthood of the Son of God is essential to all effective ministry. We need, as a priesthood, the same blessings that the disciples received from Jesus the priest. Forgiveness, so that we can experience the power of atonement in our own lives. Constant intercession, so that both our persons and our works may be accepted by our Father in heaven, notwithstanding all our failings. We need the blessing of God's peace in all present trials. We need his presence by the Holy Spirit, who alone can empower our preaching for the salvation of fallen sinners. We need a priest, and we have a priest, as much as the first disciples. And this enables us to exercise what Paul rightly refers to as the priestly service of the gospel of God. We now have the privilege of assuring the penitent that their sins are forgiven. We pray for the world and for one another, interceding for God's healing wherever we are present, Christ is present through our loving care by the work of the Holy Spirit, and we bless people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is our ongoing priestly ministry in service to Christ. Part six, resurrection and dominion. We also have a king. As Jesus displayed in his post-resurrection appearances, in his Reformed dogmatics, Herman Bavink asserts That to be made truly a priest, Jesus had to be priest in heaven, not on earth, not in man-made temple, but in heaven. He had to be on the throne of the universe. And if, in fact, the, the Christ sits on such a throne, he must be not only priest, but also king. And here I wish to make explicit that Christ exercises all three of his offices continuously and simultaneously. I think we we get a better understanding of that by looking at these post-resurrection appearances. Our Savior actively exercising prophetical, sacerdotal, also regal prerogatives during these days, showing that these offices are not separated but integrated. Michael Horton says, while there is a general progression from the state of humiliation to exaltation, from prophet to priest to king, you can see that. He's saying these offices are all present simultaneously in the unity of Christ's person and work. And so when we think of Christ's kingly reign in its eternal trajectory, we're not referring to an office that supersedes the others but stands alongside them. Bavink allows that His prophetic office comes to the fore more in the days of the Old Testament and during his days of traveling around the earth. His priestly office, more in his sufferings and death. His kingly office, more in his state of exaltation. However, the Dutch dogmatician proceeds to emphasize that Jesus bears all three offices at the same time and constantly exercises all three at once, both before and after his incarnation in both the state of humiliation and exaltation. We are separating them out somewhat for our, for our thinking, but they are integrated in the person and work of Christ himself. Christ's eternal kingship, I hardly need to remind you, is evident already from his birth in Bethlehem, the royal city of David. But even before that, when the angel Gabriel said to Mother Mary concerning the child conceived in her womb, the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. Christ was born the king incarnate. And there are so many signs of his kingship all the way through the Gospels, his constant proclamation of the kingdom of God, the appeals made to him as the son of David, so many other examples. And 
clear references of his kingship at his crucifixion. Not least on that placard that declared so helpfully his identity in three languages, no less, as king of the Jews. And it is evident from all of this that Christ was the king of God's kingdom long before he came back from the dead. Jeremy Treat correctly concludes that the empty tomb represents not Christ's resurrection in order to be king, but the resurrection of the king. Nonetheless, both resurrection and ascension are epical moments in Christ's ever-expanding kingship. We see this in Peter's preaching at Pentecost when he connects the throne oath that God swore to David with the resurrection of the Christ to bear witness that Jesus is the true and proper king, the one that God swore to give. Similarly, Paul testified that by his resurrection from the dead, the son of David specifically was declared to be the son of God in power according to the Holy Spirit. Resurrection for the apostles was declarative of Christ's dominion. What William Symington termed the inauguration solemnity of the mediatorial king. That's what the resurrection is. It is the inauguration solemnity of the mediatorial king. It should not surprise us, therefore, that in the 40 days following this resurrection from the dead, we see Christ exercising royal prerogatives. Kingship is the main focus of his teaching. To summarize what Jesus did during this liminal period leading up to the ascension, Luke informs Theophilus, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Not as a departure from any of his former doctrine, but a continuation and an amplification. Dr. Gavin observes that until now, Christ's teaching had always centered in the kingdom as its central and comprehensive theme. What follows logically, and again I quote, is that everything Jesus taught in this post-resurrection period about understanding the Old Testament and himself as its necessary fulfillment was also centered on the kingdom and put in the context of its coming. I believe the disciples witnessed a small sign of Christ's kingly ministry in the meal they shared with him by the Sea of Tiberias. You remember the story. Peter and the other disciples had been fishing all night. They had caught nothing. A man on the shore told them to cast on the other side, and they caught too many fish to haul onto the boat. By the time they reached the shore, Jesus was ready to serve them breakfast. And when Christ told his disciples to cast their nets on the other side, effectively he was giving them a command as king of the universe. It was his divine right to do so as king. And Luke uses such language explicitly in the opening of Acts, where he describes the ascension day as the day when Jesus had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And Matthew uses similar language showing Jesus in charge, telling his disciples, go, baptize, teach, make disciples. Jesus had commanded the disciples before he is commanding them again. And to foreclose any doubt about his right to issue such sweeping directives, Jesus preceded his great commission with an absolute claim to universal sovereignty. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You can't have a greater king than the one who has all authority in all places. After the ascension, the apostles, in effect, crowned Christ as king in their proclamation of the kingdom. Preaching at Pentecost, Peter said, Acts chapter 2, verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter is acknowledging Christ's royal claims with his language of enthronement, but also pointing to another kingly act when you think of it in its biblical context, namely the sending of the Spirit. A good king gives good gifts to his people. And so Jesus, with the Father, presents the Holy Spirit to his people as the best of all benefactions. 
ascended on high, the King of kings bestows this matchless gift of the Spirit on his grateful subjects from his exalted throne. What confidence this kingship should give us to carry out the Great Commission. When we go out into the world, when we, some of us have the privilege, give people the sign and seal of baptism, when we teach obedience in the Holy Spirit, when we disciple the followers of Christ, all of us can be involved in that. We do it for the cause of the kingdom. We do it with with royal protection. We do it with dominical authorization. In fulfilling this commission for Christ, we are indeed a royal priesthood. Not that this gives us license to lord anything over anyone, but serving in the name of and by the authority of the king does give us greater boldness. It hopefully makes us less fearful in the face of any spiritual opposition such as the people of God often face. Our gospel is a message from the king. Part seven, finally, the spirit of the threefold Christ, the spirit of the threefold Christ. To restate my thesis, which I promised I would do, now perhaps it makes even a little more sense. The prophetic, priestly, and kingly offices that were prophesied in the Old Testament, that were inaugurated in the incarnation, that were proclaimed publicly at our Lord's baptism, and then exercised in his earthly ministry, those offices did not cease with the climactic events of Calvary. Rather, when the loving Father summoned the redeeming Son from the grave by his life-giving Spirit, our prophet, priest, king rose again and then ascended to heaven with the full powers of his offices. Eternal prophet, eternal priest, eternal king. In developing this thesis, I've focused on the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ as a lens pretty narrow lens to his eternal ministry. In his resurrection, no less than in his crucifixion, in his exaltation as much as in his humiliation, Jesus of Nazareth exercises his threefold office as anointed prophet, priest, and king. Richard Gaffin, too, has expressed theological interest in this brief period in our Savior's life and ministry. There is perspective to be gained, he writes, by considering the overlap between the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, in which, and I still quote, Luke intimates a transforming experience for the disciples after the resurrection and before Pentecost, resulting in open, positive gospel witness. And what Gavin hopes will captivate our worship and also motivate our own witness is both Christological and pneumatological what he calls the absolute coalescence, the total congruence in the church between the work of the exalted Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, end quote. And that is my goal as well, to show the risen and descended prophet, priest, king in the power of the Holy Spirit. In his brilliant survey of the history of the Munis triplex in Christian doctrine, Jeffrey Wainwright highlights the same Christo-pneumatic connection I quote, substantially every mention of the threefold office or of one particular office explicitly or implicitly contains a reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Father's gift by which Christ himself, Christians, and the church and its ministers are all anointed. Anointed, he is saying, to the threefold office. And so what the apostles experienced in the last days of their Savior's first earthly ministry, therefore, belongs to a larger work of God the Holy Spirit in the outworking of redemption. The Spirit, who anointed Jesus for his threefold office in his baptism and later raised him from the dead to fulfill his good offices to the end of the age, that is the same Spirit who empowers us for our threefold ministry to the world. Given our weakness for this work. We praise God for Christ's threefold ministry on our behalf. We need Christ in all his offices as much as anyone does. His true word to sustain us, his abiding intercession to aid us, his sovereign rule to defend us. 
We depend on the munis triplex as much as the first disciples did. This is beautifully expressed in an article from the American Theological Review of 1859. I certainly don't know who wrote this article. Maybe somebody in this room does. But it says of Jesus that he speaks to us today as really as he did to his chosen 12 in the cities and on the plains of Judea. He intercedes for us today as truly as he did for the disciples that hung on his lips when he offered his hallowed prayer of intercession. He guides our steps as really now as he guided the steps of Peter, James, and John when he walked with them day by day. And if I were preaching this morning, as I sort of do anyway, um, this could be a word that you need to hear. Jesus is speaking to you through his word directly into your life. He's, he's praying for you. He's interceding on your behalf and all the trials that you're facing. He has guidance available for you for your next steps in life and ministry. It's as real for you as it was for Peter and Paul and all the rest of them. But the risen, ascended Lord does more than speak to us, intercede for us, guide our steps. He also preaches, prays, pronounces blessing through us as we fulfill our threefold office in his name. Through the power of his indestructible life, our prophet, priest, and king animates our ministry through the life-giving spirit, whom I believe we may term the spirit of the threefold Christ. Not a, a biblical term per se, but I think a deduction from Scripture that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the threefold Christ. He's the indispensable agent of Christ's offices in our lives and ministry, working in us and through us. Our, our prophetic pro proclamation of gospel truth, our arti articulation of biblical doctrine, our priestly intercession for the souls of the lost, our loving pastoral presence with the people of God, our vision for the global expansion of the kingdom of God, our proper exercise of Christian disciple-making, all of these prophetic, priestly, kingly roles, the Holy Spirit is using them to redeem sinners and to crown them with eternal life. I close with an old threefold prayer of surrender. Surrender in the name of Jesus by the power of the Spirit to the glory of the Father. Maybe you could make this your own prayer. Live in me, prophet, priest, and king. As prophet, lead me in thy light. As priest, present my offering. Lead and restrain me by thy might, so that as king, thou mayest fulfill in me thy kingdom, all thy will. Live, Christ, live thou in me. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Let's bow in a word of prayer. One true and holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you thanks for your multifold manifestations of your grace, for your manifold wisdom in the accomplishment of redemption. We thank you, O oh God, for the trifold work of Christ as prophet, priest, and king, this very Son in whom you are well pleased, who at this very moment intercedes for us. O oh God, as we've just heard in this reflection from your word on the mystery and mastery of the gospel, and the beauty and excellencies of Christ, our Savior, our Lord, our prophet, priest, and king, we give you thanks. So, oh God, I pray that in these truths that we bask in these moments, that indeed, as has just been prayed at the close of this lecture, that these truths would be realized in and through us, your people. We thank you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our elder brother, Amen.
invite you to take your hymnals, if you will, and turn to hymn number 180. 181, 181 my apologies. 181, let's stand together. seated just one more moment as I provide some instructions for the rest of the day. First, students, uh, we will not have prayer groups today, but there is community lunch down at the Carriage House. So students, you're welcome to do our regular Wednesday uh, lunch, the community lunch, but no prayer groups today. Alumni, if you have signed up for our lunch at 1230, uh, you are welcome to go to Montgomery Library. Yes, we are going to eat lunch in the library. And so if you've signed up for that alumni lunch, uh, please join us there at 1230. This afternoon at 215, the additional lectures will take place right here in Rust Auditorium. Many of you students have class until 3.30. We welcome you to come after class for the remainder of those lectures, but the rest of us, we can gather here at 2.15. If you are live streaming this event, you need to, in the Eventbrite sign up, make sure that you actually register for the afternoon events so that you can actually get that link to the live stream at 2.15. I also want to make note that there is a uh, number of books in the back of the auditorium here, sorry, in the lobby here in Van Til Hall. 
And I actually want to profile a couple of them. First of all, what in many ways precipitated the afternoon events is this brand new publication called Word and Spirit, Selected Writings in Biblical and Systematic Theology. These are the shorter writings of Dr. Richard B. Gaffin, Jr. that Dr. Guy Waters and I put together in this book, 12 years in the making, uh, is actually now available. And for you today, do I have a deal for you? 50% off in the bookstore in the back here today. Also, just hot off the press, in fact, pre-publication, available to you today at 50% off is our own colleague, Dr. John Curry's brand new book, The Pastor as Leader. And this also today is 50% off. So run, do not walk to the bookstore after this session and make sure you get both of those and then feel free to buy one each of everything else that is back there as well. All right, you are dismissed. We'll see you back here at 2.15. Thank you very much.